Do you like fighters or spacecraft design? Grab your copy of the first Space Dock reference book all about these topics on our Patreon through the link in the description and pinned comment below. Hello everybody, I'm Hojiwana and welcome back to Space Dock. Today we are taking a look at spacecraft movement and controls, just how exactly you get your ship to move across the vast distances between moons and planets and stars. Our propulsion video from last year was a bit of a higher level overview of this, but today I'm going to go a little more in depth on the key concepts. Largely, this is going to apply to realistic designs, as softer sci-fi typically tends to just simplify all this out for ease of understanding, as orbital mechanics and such are way out of the box for people to understand. It's a lot easier to just use air and watercraft analogies for those settings, because you've seen and know how they all work and move around. In both cases, they take the medium around them, air or water, suck it in and push it out backwards, sending the craft forwards. This is Newton's third law of motion. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. An airplane or boat's propeller pushes fluid backwards, sending the vehicle forwards. Now, this is a very important concept to understand for spacecraft in particular, as this is the only way they can really maneuver up there in vacuum. So I'm going to give a couple other examples here. First, think of just throwing a ball. While it's in your hand and you're still accelerating it, the ball pushes back on you just as much as you are pushing on it. But as you have a lot more mass than the ball, it moves an awful lot more than you do. Likewise, when you catch a ball, the same thing occurs while you decelerate it. The second example is a simple cannon. There's the cannon itself, the ball, and the explosive propellant like gunpowder that gets ignited and then expands as it turns into a gas. The ball gets accelerated one way, out of the barrel, and the cannon recoils the other way. Both are moved by the same amount of force, but because the ball has a lot lower mass, it gets accelerated more. That is essentially how rocket engines work. They just have the system of throwing out mass set up to be most efficient for creating recoil over longer periods of time. You can use a gun to move, but it's going to come in jolts and isn't very efficient. A rocket engine takes the same components and reorganises them. There's still a gun, in the form of the engine itself, and there's still mass getting sent away just like the cannonball. This mass has a special name in this context, reaction mass, because it makes the equal and opposite reaction. For rocket engines, this reaction mass, or just remass, comes in the form of a hot gas. Wait, wait, so hang on a minute, why not just chuck out propellant some other way though? You could just squirt water out of the bottom with air pressure, like with a bottle rocket, and it would move, right? Well, yes, but the water wouldn't be going very fast, so you wouldn't be getting much force out of it to push your craft along. If instead you burn your remass and turn it into a gas, there's more energy released as the gas expands, which can be captured and directed with a nozzle. If you remember the propellant from the cannon example, it was stored as gunpowder. Rockets can be just the same, and can have their propellant stored in a solid or liquid form. As they burn, they make loads of gas, which is funneled in the opposite direction to where the rocket wants to go. There's only so much you can get out of burning stuff like this though. It's great for thrust and decently efficient, but what about going further? What about going faster? Well, rather than burning our propellant, we can just heat it up using other methods, such as a nuclear reactor, or electrical resistance, or even through capturing sunlight. There are other engine types out there that all rely on good old Newton's third, but which use very different methods of accelerating their remass, such as ion drives. There's a lot of variety of these, but they all spit out electrically charged particles as their remass, fired out at velocities much, much higher than what traditional rockets can achieve. The higher the velocity, the more efficient the engine is. The downside is the extremely low thrust, as while the remass is sent zooming out at high speed, there's very little of it being sent out per second. There's even more exotic engine types that go above and beyond what ions and their kin can achieve, like the huge variety of fusion engines that are theoretically possible. I promised a video or two covering these already, but I wanted to get this one out to set you all up with the basics first. Subscribe now for those future videos on fusion engines, nuclear bomb engines, sails and other such things over the coming months. 
So that's our main engine sorted out. It shoots out reaction mass in one direction to make the rocket accelerate in the opposite direction. But how do you turn? First of all, quick primer on the six degrees of freedom. The first three are about rotating without moving and are pitch, where you change heading, the direction you're pointing in, by rotating up and down. Yaw, where you change heading by rotating side to side. Roll, where you rotate along the vessel's length without changing heading at all. The remaining three degrees of freedom are all moving without changing heading in three dimensions. Up or down, left or right, forward or back. Main engines are extremely good at one of those, the forward one, but how do you achieve all the others while in vacuum? There's no atmosphere to help pitch or roll or yaw by using control surfaces, so instead spacecraft use reaction control systems, also known as attitude control systems. This RCS utilises a number of smaller thrusters set at distances and angles away from the vehicle's centre of mass. When they fire, they cause the vessel to spin or to stop spinning. You can also fire them in groups to get those sideways movements I demonstrated previously. Just for rotation without movement, it is also possible to use conservation of angular momentum to spin the ship without spending precious remass. By spinning up or slowing down flywheels on the vessel, it's possible to make the entire craft rotate. You can even try this yourself at home if you have a spinny chair. Just wiggle yourself to change the direction you're facing. I'll wait while you spin all the way around. OK, I don't care if you're done, I'm going to carry on. There's also another way to change heading without using RCS or flywheels, but instead with the main engine. By simply diverting the thrust to not go through the vehicle's centre of mass, the now angled thrust makes you rotate. This is called thrust vectoring and can be done a number of ways. The first one is thrust vanes, where you stick some fins into the plume to direct it. It's very easy to do this as long as the vanes can withstand the plume. You can also just move the entire engine on gimbals, or even just the nozzle as many modern fighter jets do. All of these options can also be used as thrust reverses, though for spacecraft it's generally going to be simpler to just flip the entire ship around and burn backwards to slow down, or sideways, or downways, or whichever ways you need to burn, because orbits are absolutely nothing like any other way of travelling. They're really hard to comprehend and actually understand without getting hands-on experience by like becoming an astronaut, or by blowing up small green astronauts in Kerbal Space Program. As a very basic run-through, orbits themselves involve falling sideways so quickly around an object that you miss the ground. Beyond orbits, travelling between bodies in space occurs in great big arcs, and as there's nothing to slow you down once you're going, you don't need to maintain that speed by constantly running your engine. The downside is that once you're at your destination, you need to slow down again to meet it. Or if you have super amazing engines like in The Expanse, you spend all your time burning in order to reduce travel times. Also, depending on the flight plan, the direction you burn in may not be at all what you expect it to be, as NASA found out on the Gemini 4 mission. It was June in 1965, and Jim McDivitt was piloting his capsule in an attempt to meet his own discarded rocket upper stage, but had difficulty, because doing something obvious, like pointing at the target and burning to catch up to it, actually ended up putting him further away from it. Yes, that's right, not even NASA fully understood what to do before they tried it, and learned an awful lot, which they put into practice six months later with Gemini 6 and 7. So, that's a quick rundown of how to move around in space in a realistic manner. Well done for keeping up, it's a complicated subject. You can see why it's so very common for sci-fi to ignore a great deal of this, or only take key parts that are easily understandable, like Bo pulling a maverick with thrust vectoring to blow up some TIE interceptors. For your own creations, you can do the same. There's no need to make use of every element of realistic physics for space travel, just like the RCS in Battlestar Galactica. You can just pick and choose the bits you like to give a bit of flavour to a setting. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our Space Fighter design reference book. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.